to Wonders and Miracles podcast, where we celebrate miraculous moments in everyday lives. I'm Liza Lawrence. I'm glad to have you join me as we celebrate wonders and miracles together. All right. Well, I am here with Stacy today from Virginia, and it's fun to finally meet Stacy. She's followed my podcast for a while now and found it from a search for miracle stories, and she's been a great supporter for the podcast. So Stacy, I'm glad you're on. Today, she is going to share experiences that she's had, the trials that she's had, and how her faith has really gotten her through the hard times. So Stacy, thanks for being on and tell us your journey. Hi. Okay. I'm so happy to be on your podcast. I, it's like a dream come true. Hey, I, I finally get to meet you. So I guess I'll just start at the beginning. I grew up many different places uh, because my parents worked overseas. Normally when we were back in the U.S., I was either in Ohio or Florida I'm a product uh, of divorce, so that was, you know, difficult to begin with as most kids. So I was like seven, and my mom divorced and remarried, and I have two brothers, so one, we're 18 months apart, and then the other brother, technically my half-brother, but I would never think of him like that, we're nine years apart. He's my mom and stepfather's. Mm -hmm. son. You know, at the beginning, like my faith, it's always been really important, but it had to be formed. And there were some very important people in my life who, you know, helped me develop my faith and strengthen it. And the first person who I'd say she's like the cornerstone of my faith, it's it was this babysitter that I had when my mom was living in Chicago and getting to know my stepfather I call him dad. So she hired this babysitter and she was a black American woman, an elderly woman, and she had a deep, deep faith. And every day, her name is Mrs. Anderson. So we go, bye, Mrs. Anderson. She goes, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow if the Lord says the same. And she was just like, she exuded her faith. My brother and I, who are 18 months apart, his name is Shane. So Stacy and Shane. Okay. So if something broke or something while she was watching us, you know, we knew our parents would be really upset. She'd say, let's pray about it. And her prayers, like they always worked. And her prayer was that she wanted to live to see all her relatives die. And she said, so, so far God is honoring that. We bought her her first cane. Sometimes Shane and I would spend the night at her house. Like she just had so much faith. Like I'll never forget that. I remember one time uh, Shane and I went, she wanted us to go sing at her church. So it was a predominantly black church. And we went and the song that we sang, I don't know what it was called, but the words were trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust in and obey. She was loving, and but yet she was funny too. I learned through her with the little things, if you have faith, like we, you know, if something broke, we pray that my parents would not be angry. And if you have faith in the little things, then it starts to stretches to the big things. And other people who were very influential in my faith were my grandparents. At one time, I was like, wow, I'm so lucky. I have three sets of living grandparents. But it was my mom's parents, Charles and Evelyn Kaufman, who influenced my faith the most. They lived in Florida, and I'd go to church with them. And I remember like lying on their king-size bed and my grandfather reading parables from the Bible and just talking about faith. And my grandmother, she would start every day with her devotions. Before she even got out of bed, she'd be reading whatever devotional material she read and praying. So then my senior year of high school, I went to a boarding school in Morocco because my parents were living in another country and there wasn't a school there. But during that time, like a lot of my friends, they had their appendix out. And my dad was really paranoid about appendicitis because I guess he'd gotten it when he was five or something. 
So I remember like growing up every single stomach ache, every, oh my gosh, it's appendicitis. Let's go to the hospital, get in the car, go to the hospital. So then we were living in this country. I'm not going to tell you the name of the country, but we were living there. And finally, his greatest fears and that he's been prepared for and mobilized for like all our lives became reality. And I got appendicitis and there was no time to be medevaced or anything. In fact, it was the first time an expat had ever had such a medical emergency. I went to the local hospital and first of all, my parents had to clean out the whole room and get a plumber to fix the bathroom. This country, I loved where we were living. It was just uh, the conditions, you know, I had to walk to the operating room. Then I remember the last thing I remember before I was out was there were flies in the operating room and I was just going to ask if somebody could shoo the flies away. And then that's the last thing I remember. So they gave me too much anesthesia. So it took me a while to come out of it. I survived. Well, obviously <laughs> I survived, but that was a miracle in itself. And then I went into the Peace Corps. So I lived in Senegal, West Africa. And it's funny how one thing prepares you for another. And so I applied for the Peace Corps at the time that I was in the Peace Corps. It took about a year from when you apply to when you're actually accepted. So meanwhile, I had just graduated from college and I was looking for a job. I see this as a miracle. There was an opening at this transitional center for the mentally ill, and it was called the Gathering Place. My biological father is, has had issues with mental illness. I called to apply for the job. And when I was talking to the person, like, like I just knew, like I was the person for this job. I had to give a year's commitment. So I did. And I just loved that job. So that was, you know, just to find a job like that, that was such a great fit. It was definitely divine intervention. Yeah. So then when I was in the Peace Corps, I was in a remote village in the region of Tambacunda, and I had to ride a bike for 25 kilometers to get to the village. This ended up being so wonderful because I don't drive, my eyesight's very bad. So when they told me I'd had, have to ride a bike for 25 kilometers, I was like, I can't, I can't ride a bike in traffic. And they're like, don't worry, the road is deserted. I mean, just bikes go on the road. So that was nice. Uh, and it was, you know, remote village, no electricity, no running water. It was an incredible experience. And I saw God in those people. There were different religions in Senegal, like there's uh, animist, Catholic, Muslim. And I was like, oh, gosh, I really hope I get in a Catholic village because that would be like similar to my faith. And I ended up in a Muslim village, but I'm so glad mm -hmm. because in some of the Catholic villages, you know, they have something called palm wine and they sit around and they drink. I mean, I would have, I'm like an all or nothing person. I'm sure, sure I might have whiled away the days sitting under the tree drinking palm wine. So again, like God knew where I was supposed to be. And the Muslim religion, it's just, it's two paths to the same thing. The people I lived with are so peaceful and it was just wonderful. I was working as a Peace Corps volunteer at the embassy and then I extended my service and then the job became like no longer fell under Peace Corps jurisdiction. So afterwards, I wanted to stay. And my friend, Daphne, she had such a good heart, so kind. She offered for me to live with her because she had an extra room. So I accepted that. She was so positive and supportive. And one of the things that I knew about her was she lost her brother in a traumatic way, actually. And I remember just like, oh, just feeling so bad for her and, you know, not understanding and just not being able to imagine or even saying, gosh, if I lost any of my brothers, I would just die. While I was in Senegal, 
a friend of mine who I went to high school with and knew from Pakistan. I used to live in Pakistan too. She came to visit me in the Peace Corps and it was so wonderful. Her name is Aisha. So the two of us went to my village, you know, and it was just, I mean, so nice to see her and everything. And then, uh, so public transportation for Peace Corps volunteers, there's something called in French, it's like la gare routière. It's like the roadside station. And you go to this and wherever you want to go in Senegal, they have cars. So you just would go to a car and say where you wanted to go. And then when the car filled up, you would go. My friend and I took this mode of transportation and we were riding back from Tambacunda to Dakar because that's where I was working after the Peace Corps and living uh, with my friend. As I was riding, it was a beautiful sunny day. Oh, it was just so just incredible. And I remember thinking, wow, here I am. I'm in Africa. And this is just, ah, oh, it's beautiful to be in Africa and just beautiful day. And then I remember thinking, wow, you know, if somebody were dead, they could see me now. And then it's a journey continued. It was like a seven hour journey a couple times, like during the journey, I felt like this touch or something. It seemed like a touch, you know, like on my shoulder. I was sitting in the way back of the car. So there was nobody behind me, but I, like it was so strong. Like I, I looked back, like to see if anything was there. We continued on our journey. When I got back to my apartment that I shared with Daphne, my wonderful friend who who lost her brother and there was a note waiting from Richard, my now husband, and it said, unless you are very tired or sick, call me as soon as you get back. And I just like, I knew like something horrible had happened. You know, my friend was like, no, no, you know, why are you worried? Don't, and I'm like, he would never, you know, at the note just, it was ominous. Oh, I was terrified. So anyway, I called him and he said, I'll be right over. So he came over and then he told me that Shane was in an accident and he's, his words were, and he didn't make it. Mm. But at least God put him there to tell me, you know, I didn't have to hear the news. Apparently my mom had his number and she was calling and calling and, you know, I wasn't there because I was in my village with my friend Aisha. And finally, he's like, look, you know, can I help? You know, what can I do? You know, can I tell her anything? And then my mom told him. And then he told me. So I'm thankful for that. I mean, it was a really, it was really my first, like experience with death. And, you know, and, and my brother and I were so close too. I kept thinking about is, you know, he was never happy in life. For all our moves, you know, moving's hard. For anything that happened to me, and I had a hard time, he had, a, it was worse for him. Everything was worse. You know, I just. It is interesting to me how similar experiences affect people differently. Our temperament, our personality, our perception of what's going on really is unique to ourselves and can affect people very differently. I think that's one thing to learn is to have compassion on one another, that your experience is not the same as that other person's experience. You know, I think that's so, that's so right. I was able to keep my faith through that. Do you feel like that was him in the car? Like, could you, do you think that was his presence in the car? You know, like I truly do because I've never had that again. And one thing that I'm really, you know, I wish would happen is I wish I dream about him, but you know, I haven't had a dream. And I feel like it was so strong, the sense that somebody, when then thinking, you know, if someone died, you yeah. know, they could see me now. Right, so interesting. You know? And looking back, you know, like feeling like it so strongly, the, yeah. the touch or the, I don't know what it was or the presence. So that's been a comfort to me. So meanwhile, then I married my husband, Richard, 
and we ended up having four kids and also there were some miscarriages during that and that's also like it was very hard you know i was like i wanted to name all my kids names that are comforting and symbolic of faith so my daughter's name michelle means who is like the lord christopher means peacemaker and then nicholas so he was born close to christmas it's kind of like playing on that and then jonathan is god is gracious so and all through my pregnancies like you know through the losses and everything my faith and god helped me through those difficult situations so then time goes on and i worked at one place and just this work situation just wasn't a good situation and there were some other things around this time too that were like causing past trauma to reemerge you know and i was just i was not in good shape and i remember just being desperate so i i found a therapist and i i don't drive because of my eyesight so i needed some place i could walk to you know and some place that had openings and some place that wasn't so expensive so i called this place and they they paired me with a resident so then i started seeing her and that was like a great match because she was a former Peace Corps volunteer. So that was very, very helpful. So my parents settled in New Hampshire. My brother, Travis, also was in New Hampshire with his family. So I have four kids. He has four kids. And he finally got settled. And, and Travis, he was like, everybody loved him. Like, and he was the greatest uncle. You know, he just had so much energy. He was beloved in the community. And, you know, so many people he just, he touched lives of so many people. And then the evening of Monday, March 7th, the phone rang and I picked up the phone and it was my mom. And I was like, oh, you know, I just talked to you yesterday. I could tell something was wrong. And she was like, it's bad. And then she said, uh, Travis died. He shot himself, uh, you know, so it's just like, ugh. it was unimaginable because he lives in the small town. The paramedics who came to their house, like they knew him and they got the call. They're like, oh, that's not, it's the wrong address. You know, wow. it's like nobody would have ever imagined this, but I have to say, thank God. I was already had this network of therapy and support in place. Otherwise, I don't know how I could have gotten through it. So that's divine intervention again. And that's a miracle, you know, that even though there were hard things that led me to it, I didn't realize that things were even going to get, get harder. And perhaps even had you not had that in place before, you might not have been strong enough to take action to get that support after. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because I was hard and hardly strong enough to get it to begin with, yeah. you know, because what people don't realize is when you're going through a very difficult time, you can't just say, oh, call a doctor, call a therapist. The person who's going, who's in the middle of this can't do anything. That's a very good point. So one thing, one thing that my brothers did not have that I have is my faith. So throughout, you know, I have felt God's presence throughout my life and every day, even with my work, like when I go to work, I'll say a prayer about the kids I work with or stop in the moment, you know, if something's hard and say, please help. And, you know, I always get a sense of peace and of course, even my four children, like if you have children, you know, like, and after pregnancy loss, I realized like how every child is a miracle. I know how painful pregnancy loss can be and, and how your faith can sustain you. So now I'm not in therapy, but I am being sustained by my faith. And there are miracles all around us. And people just be open and 
you'll see them. <laughs> Amen. I love that. Well, as I'm listening, I'm just amazed at what a rich life experience that you've had. You've had so many rich life experiences, good and bad. But from that, you can take and see the lessons that you've learned and where God has shown up in those moments. Do you have a daily practice, a daily spiritual practice? Are you part of a religion? What, what other aspects of spirituality sustain you and support you? So that's a great question, Liza. So I've been exposed to so many different religions. My dad is an ordained minister in the Disciples of Christ Church, but I, I feel like we didn't go to church that much growing up. We went on Christmas C and E's. C and E's. But when we had to go to church, we went to church. But even though, you know, I say we didn't go to church, like my dad, he lives his ministry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and then my grandparents were Episcopalian. So when I went to church with them, I was ultimately confirmed Episcopalian. And in college, I did everything. So I went with the born agains. I went with the uh, Hare Krishnas. I went with the Lutherans. You know, I went to different churches, but, you know, I still kept the core of my faith. And uh, then in the Peace Corps, you know, I was in a Muslim village. And then I married my husband. And my husband's a cradle Catholic. We say that, you know, when somebody grows, grows up Catholic. I knew he was like, he was Catholic through and through. I was thinking there are enough problems in marriage without having two different religions, right? So I converted to Catholicism. And that's been like so wonderful in the respect that it's, it's consistent. We go to church every Sunday and like in the past, left to my own devices, you know, I probably wouldn't go to church every Sunday, but yet I knew it was important to my husband and I've never gone to church and said, gee, I wish I hadn't gone. It's nice to have something constant. And I also have, I, I'm open-minded, you know. Well, I think, I think from your life experience, having explored so many ideas it does make you open-minded. And I actually believe that's a really healthy way to be in your spirituality is very open-minded. Right. So, and like I said, different paths to the same thing. So my personal practice is I have some devotional like magazines that I get. So I read that. And then I read Jesus Calling. It's a book of devotions that you can mm -hmm. read. The author wrote it based on scripture, but like Jesus is talking to you. Oh, I like that. And I read it over and over because it's, I, you know, it's something that's timeless. I'll yeah, have so to look those up. Out. I will. I love it. I yes. will. And as I've prayed and meditated on how can I open up to more love? How can we fix a lot of these problems? I keep hearing spend time with me, like spend time with the Lord, yes, right? Yes, and yes. It, it's helpful to me. So that's what I do. I try to do at the minimum. And, you know, like, and I also have this uh, prayer journal, but all of these, you know, it goes and ebbs and flows. Yes. So now I'm pretty, you know, in a routine, but, you know, sometimes I'll go and, you know. I think that's life. That is how life goes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know if you're on Instagram. Mm-hmm. One thing I like, I went and I followed all these like positive women of prayer or something. And there are all these different groups. And now when I look at my news feed, it's like, you know, nice. again, another devotion some yes. days, you know, yes. because I'm getting all these. Uh, That's, I think that I love as I'm listening to you, you have done so much to just almost inundate your life with spirituality. And I think that is so powerful when we want to stay anchored in our faith is to remind ourselves daily, often that God is around and miracles abound, but we have to remind ourselves. You are so right. I just want to focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. So I read positive books that also I have like positive movies, you know, positive songs, you know, people are talking about the news and the virus, you know, yep. 
I just, I mean, I know that's out there and maybe I'm living in a bubble. Yeah, I am. I know that's out there, but. You know what? I do the very same thing, actually. My husband stays up on the news and it feels heavy. And I I don't, I know what's going on, but I don't need to inundate my mind with that. I love to stay focused on the positive as well. I think it is very healthy (laughs) in a lot of ways to, to focus on things that uplift the spirit rather than make it feel heavy. Exactly. It's like living the scripture, let your light shine so that people can yes. see, right? Like if we were all in the heaviness, we wouldn't be able to see the light from the people that are wanting to focus on the light. And so I think we do need people that, like us that live in a bubble <laughs> that say, right. say yes. okay, I'm going to stay in the positive so that we can at least shine a little bit in, in a heavy world. Right. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. And I love like happy, feel good television shows. Have you watched The Chosen? Have you seen that yet? I haven't. It's all about Jesus's life. And it is so uplifting and beautiful. And the acting, I've been so impressed. It really brings the scriptures to life. You really feel a personal connection with Jesus and the apostles and it's beautifully done. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, Stacy, uh, it's been so fun to visit with you and to get to know you. I appreciate you reaching out and sharing you, the miracles that you've seen and how faith has really supported you through your life. I love it. Well, thank you. It's been my honor to be on your podcast. And I hope I can recruit some other people to share Please their do. miracles because honestly, there are so many. There are so many. And so hopefully I'll send some more people Perfect. your way. <laughs> I would love it. Thank you so much for listening to this miracle story. Please subscribe to my channel if you